Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity Streetsville's online service for this Sunday morning. If you're joining us for the first time, we're especially glad that you're here. It's our hope that something this morning will resonate with you. And if you'd like to find out more about who we are, there's uh, lots of ways in the details below to do that. If you'd like to connect with us, we would love to connect with you however and whenever you would like that. If you've been tracking with us for a while and you haven't liked us on Facebook or subscribed to our YouTube channel, this morning would be a great time to do that too. Stay informed and stay up to date. We are continuing with our sermon series, Stories to Live By. Jesus knew how stories resonate in our hearts and in our beings, and he taught with stories a lot. We call them parables. He talked about uh, lost things and lost people and how much joy there is when those are found. So this morning, Daniel will be unpacking both a lost thing, the lost coin, and a lost person, the lost son, in his uh, teaching this morning. But before we do that, why don't we just prepare our hearts and minds and pray together. Father God, we give you thanks that we can come to you no matter how we are. Some of us have had fantastic weeks that have been filled with joy, and others of us have been frustrated and scared, and we are almost done. And however we are, some of us don't even know why we're here. So we give you thanks that we can lay all of that before you and just enter into your presence and that you welcome us and that you speak your truth and your wisdom into our hearts and into our lives. So Holy Spirit, we pray that only your truth would be spoken here this morning and only your truth received. And we give you all thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So now we're going to join with Libby and the band and raise our voices in worship to our glorious God. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We are so glad that you've decided to join us this morning for worship. Father God, we come before you so grateful for the joy that you put in our hearts, a joy that cannot be stolen. This is a joy that comes from knowing you, the God who heals and saves and always makes a way, the one so worthy of our praise. Amen. We worship the God who was. We worship we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your 
of a love forever and ever. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless?
Luke 15, the parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy, worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So, that, so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded to him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are, all, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Good morning and once again, welcome to Online Church here in Trinity. We're just so glad that you can join us today. How many of us were glad that the province entered step three of the reopening plan on Friday? Uh, I sure was glad. I had missed so much of indoor dining, gym, celebrating, weddings in person. And I just found it such a pleasant surprise that we pushed up the opening nearly a week before expected. Most of us are glad when something uh, lost comes back unexpectedly. And that's the theme of today's stories told by Jesus. It's not one, but two stories which deal with loss and the joy of finding what has been lost. Maybe different ones of us have fresh memories of dealing with loss, uh, whether it's the loss of a family member, a friend, the loss of business, the loss of time with loved ones, the loss of health, even for those of us who may have gotten ill and recovered, the loss of routine, 
and the loss of comfort zone. We're just thankful that many of these things were able to put into the past and we're able to look forward and move into a brighter future. We can count our blessings that some of these losses are temporary and they will be gone with all of these reopenings, but some of our losses are permanent. It is this prospect of permanent loss, which is explored in the two stories that Jesus mentioned and we read today, the story of the lost coin and the story of the lost sons. Either son or sons, I'll leave you to decide by the end of this uh, sermon. Uh, in fact, these two stories are part of a trilogy. Uh, in fact, all great stories are usually in trilogies, as movie buffs would know. And G uh, uh, G Jesus said these stories at different times, but Luke chose to put them together to address a topical question. So uh, I just want to make a few general observations as we go on. Firstly, uh, Luke throws out these stories, as I mentioned just now. The general objection that he wants to address is that same accusation that the Pharisees and, Sa and Sadducees always threw at Jesus. In Luke chapter 15, verse 2, uh, they accuse Jesus that this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. In other words, he gets himself defiled. You know, he's not pure because he's hanging out with people who are impure. Uh, you know, it's like you can tell the value of a man through his friends and uh, he's keeping too many friends who are sinners. Rob's sermon last week, by the way, dealt with the issue of drawing lines and Luke has his own take on what it means in terms of not drawing lines with sinners and to welcome them. And so I think that this story really builds on what Rob actually shared last week. Uh, but his perspective actually takes us behind the curtain, if you like, to focus on the emotions of God when working with and dealing with sinners. Um, now, as I mentioned just now, these stories are all told at different times, but Luke puts them together. Why does he arrange it that way? What we see in these stories are repeated themes. And because today, uh, in the interest of time, we won't be going all three stories. You could read them if you want in Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost sons. But for today's purposes, we will be going through the lost coin and the lost sons. Uh, with every parable and every story, the observations repeat, but they get deeper. And I think it's this increasing depth that Jesus had, and, uh, had in mind and Luke had in mind when he arranged the stories this way. So, uh, back to general comments once again. Uh, I think that if you pay attention to the reading we did just now, you'll notice that the difference between the coin and the sons is that the coin is an item with economic value, right? It's an object, inanimate object, whereby one wants it because of the limited value that it has in it. In comparison, you have the sons. And, well, you can't measure this economically. It is they are priceless, right? Uh, it's not measured in economic terms, it's measured in relational terms. Secondly, there's deliberate action by the father to seek what is lost in both stories. In the story of the woman with the coin, the woman lights a lamp, sweeps the house, searches and combs carefully until she finds it. That's in verse 8. Uh, whereas in verse 12 and 13, uh, you get the other problem, which is that if you want to find a coin, that's possible because it's inanimate, it's stuck in one place, comb it carefully and systematically and you'll probably find it. But what do you do relationally with a son who wants to be out of your life in verse 12 and 13. So it moves deeper from God, the searcher, from God, the one who loves um, what is lost, from God who is taking so much initiative to now the real human problem of free will and what do you do with human beings. So God's action searches for the sinner and yet leaves his hands open for the sinner to respond. And I just want to share with us that there is this sense when reading this story that the prodigal son coming to his senses and choosing to come back is actually indeed rare, right? Uh, most of us who kind of take the kind of extreme route in life never ever look back, you know? And you have a case where the father is looking out and being quite sure that his son is almost dead. Uh, but 
then realizing to his surprise that his son has actually decided to come back. The twist in this story, however, is that for the accusers who were listening to Jesus' story, they only felt that there was one category of people who were lost. These category, this category is the sinners. The, the Pharisees were so proud of their observance of the law, of their ritual purity, right, that they really drew lines with these sinners who were lost. They would have heard the lost coin as just referred to the sinners, they would have heard the story of the lost son, especially the younger son, as referring to the sinners. But in this case, um, there was a twist where suddenly Jesus starts talking about the older brother. And in the parable of the lost sons, what actually happens is that it's revealed. Both sons are not on the same page as the father. And there's that complexity of winning them both. The twist in Jesus' story is that it's really directed towards his accusers. And you would think that it's meant to rebut them, it's meant to show them up that they don't know what they're talking about. But it, when Jesus tells the parable of the lost sons, he's really appealing to his accusers who fit very much like the elder brother and who were themselves lost. He was trying to help them to understand, you too are lost. Will you accept what the Father has for you? And that story ends on a cliffhanger. Let me just go to one more general observation. There's also an element of celebration in both. And there's a deeper sense of celebration for the son, the younger son, because it was much harder than finding a coin. Uh, the, the celebration seems to pull out of the, all the stops because twice the phrase is mentioned, especially when referring to the son or referring to the younger brother, that he is dead and has come back to life. Life, he was lost and has been found. A last general observation, and let's just go right into the meat of the message. Uh, this deliberate action to seek for the lost costs the father expensively and dearly. It is an unprecedented level of loss of his dignity, loss of his reputation. And um, there's a lot that can be said about this, but I do want to uh, pull you to two verses. Uh, verse 20, how the father runs to the younger son and kissed him. Uh, fathers do not run in ancient Jewish culture. Uh, in verse 28, the father came out from the party to plead with the older son. Again, a word that does not square in with Jewish culture. Well, what then are we supposed to take away from these stories? We are, in gen very general terms, we are invited to understand our God as a God of great loss, a God of great joy, and a God of great love. And so let me just share that um, with us today. And these concepts are so interrelated because if there's no love, there is no sense of loss. And if there is no loss, there's no great joy that comes at the end of it. So let's jump into it. First of all, he's a God of great loss. Uh, one of the things to understand this um, so well is to realize that God loves humans in a way that you and I are just beginning to understand. You know, um, philosophers have often debated whether or not our prayers, does every one prayer make a difference to the existence of God? Would God gain or lose from having one new follower or a thousand new followers? And the answer is that God's existence is never in threat. God does not need human beings in that kind of way. But God feels loss, loss of relationship, especially when his children go their own way. I think the only best way to actually say it is that uh, if you lose a friend, uh, you, it doesn't mean that you lose uh, any part of your existence, whether it's your arms or your legs, but if you, but that sense of loss and pain is still very, very palpable. And so it is with God. God to God, losing his children to sin is a pain in which um, our pandemic and the losses we had during the pandemic is just a shadow of. You see, um, the way God describes his loss of his children is that of the word death. God was not lying in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, when he said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. He wasn't threatening his children. He wasn't saying, I'm going to, I'm out to punish you. He was describing a state of fact that if anyone lives in the existence of sin, that existence is death. It's separation from him. The whole human race is already on this path of death. So no wonder the phrase is repeated twice, that this son of mine, this brother of yours is dead and come to life. He was lost and has been found, verse 24 and verse 32. Uh, I think one of the things we need to understand, uh, people of God, is that for anyone to turn to Christ, it is a deep 
miracle. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, it says that we were dead to trespasses and sins in which we once lived we, when we were following the cause of this world. Anyone who is just following the cause of this world is actually dead to God. But we were once dead, but we now live. And God feels that loss keenly and greatly. And hence, having a God who feels the, the separation of his children so keenly, we as the church are actually invited. We're invited to understand, participate, to feel the burden and the grief of God for a hurt and dying world. There is a sense of urgency about our gospel message. There is a sense whereby people need to know Jesus. People need to know the Word of God. People need to turn away from the cause of this world so that in Jesus they can find eternal life. So I want to suggest to us as the church that we need to catch God's vision about restoring the lost to himself. That being with God Almighty is not just a choice among many religions or philosophies. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And sin has no gain of its own. Evil is just pure loss. So you see that in the stories we read just now, God lights a lamp and this lamp actually represents the church. That's in verse 8. The, uh, God sweeps the house carefully to find for the one who is lost. And yet like the father in the prodigal sons, he is looking far, looking wide for the loss to take that first step home. God feels that seriousness of the separation and the grief that comes with it. So, so in simple terms, let's come back to this thing about uh, what Jesus was being accused of. Hanging out with sinners too much. Eating with them too much. Why did Jesus hang out so much and talk to sinners? In simple terms, God misses sinners. In the human person of Jesus Christ, God in his fullness was present. Present to sinners. He misses their company. He is willing to spend time with them. He could spend time instructing the righteous in many a homily which would never be, uh, which would have no equal, which would be so precious and so, uh, so astounding. And yet he chose to spend time with sinners. And you know something, church, if we were to catch the vision of God in a, for a broken and dying world, right, then we need to understand that, that, you know, when Jesus is hanging with sinners, you can be sure that he was not always serious all the time. Uh, he was not always religious in chatting with them, you know. For, for, for the sinners to actually enjoy his company, he must have talked about things which interested them or whether it's their jobs, families, interests, or even daily life. The, the sinners would have brought their habits along with them, you know. Uh, there, there will be some alcoholics there. There will be some people who, who are doing uh, different things. And, and, you know, it's like they would, they would have felt that he allowed them to be who they truly were. And, you know, what is so surprising through the interaction with Jesus is that sinners are actually more interested in the gospel than the Pharisees expected. Uh, that's why they kept hanging around Jesus. That's why they nearly scandalized him. God misses people who are estranged from him. We are called upon to grasp this vision of humanity so that we can be peacemakers, like in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, and reconciling others to God in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Well, he's a God of great loss, but in the midst of that loss, he's a God of great joy. Uh, there's tremendous joy when people are restored. There, there's tremendous joy when we, when, when we see the dead raised to life. That's actually what God was talking about. He said, this son of mine was dead, he's now back to life. And we as the church are called upon to participate in this miracle. The one thing that these stories have in common is that there's this tremendous joy that God and His church experience. And my prayer is that our church will be a church of this kind of joyfulness. The, the, the woman in the story says, Rejoice with me. I found a coin that I lost. And therefore Jesus said, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In verse 24, the father of the two lost sons got all his neighbours together and began to celebrate. God intends for his church to see miracles upon miracles. I, I want to share with us that if we can capture the depth of God's vision and if we realise how good the gospel is, how pure the gospel is, how the gospel is great news uh, for people who kind of like just 
passing their time and just running through their own course in life. And if we realize that, there will be great celebration in the house of God. There, there, there will be, uh, church would never be the same again. It will be one story after the next. Uh, who knows, by listening to the stories of Jesus, our own stories that we live by are going to be completely different. Our own, the story of our church is going to be impacted precisely because we chose to bear the burden that God has. From great loss comes great joy. But who then does God want to restore? Would it only be the younger son? Would it only be the one who is lost? We, we need to understand that God wants to restore all kinds of people. I know that the younger son is definitely a prime candidate. He broke all the rules. He had a lot to repent of. of. He, he went to his father and said, I've sinned against heaven and against you. In other words, what he was saying is that I, I, I broke all the taboos of society. I went against all the code of acceptable conduct. I took my inheritance before you were dead. In other words, I wish you were dead. And I said that to your face and I wasted your money. And I've done all these things I'm not proud of. Therefore, I need to repent, I need to be restored. But was he the only one who was lost? We discover God the Father's love for the older brother. The older brother was all the time in the house of God, but he needed restoration. He never got into trouble. He did all his stuff on time. He never, but he never understood tragically what it was like to be a son of the father. You know, in the words that he says just shows his perspective. The older son said that all these years I've worked like a slave for you. Or if you read another translation, all these years I've slaved in your household. It's not my household. It's not our household. It's your household. All these years I've been like a slave. The, rep, the, the, the status of someone who doesn't belong to the family. And, and so he saw himself when he was obeying all those rules as if he had this heavy taskmaster he had to please. And yet, you would never even give me a young goat, verse 29. You wouldn't even give me something small that I can rejoice in. In. Brothers and sisters, maybe you're watching this today and all your life, maybe you've discovered religion, but you have not uh, discovered enough of the lovely joyfulness of God. How much God delights in you, how much He sees you as a son, as a daughter, how precious you are in His household. And the same thing that the father said to this older brother is what he says to you today. Son, all I have is yours. All I have is yours. You could have taken the young goat anytime you wanted. You could have enjoyed being with my blessings anytime you wanted. And what matters is you need to understand, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are that precious to me. In some ways, the, the, the story of the older son is actually harder because it required a paradigm shift. It was harder to redeem him. He was in the household and yet, lost. He needed to relearn so much. Uh, not just the responsible heart of the father, but the merciful heart of the father and hold both in good tension. Lastly, I want to talk about the God of great love. We see that the way the, the, the stories talk about the, the God sweeping across, lighting a lamp, searching until we are found. And I want to explain this in terms of how Jesus is sent as a sacrifice for us. He rose from the dead so we can have new life. He, he, God takes no delight in consigning people to hell. He takes great delight in bringing us back to the relationship we had with Him. This came at the Father's great personal cost. Uh, as creator of the universe, center of the universe, he had no need to leave heaven where he was. Uh, God the Son did not have to leave heaven. He did not have to ha come as a human being just to die for us and to rise from the dead for us. Um, you, you, you see such parallels in what, in the story that Jesus told. The father ran after the son, as I mentioned just now. The, the father pleads with the older brother. And this mercy of the father actually scandalizes him. No one in Jewish culture would have considered this as a father worth respecting. He's a father who gave too much. He's a father who has given away his image, given away his reputation, given away his face, and, you know, in a way, he's given away his possessions because the younger brother has squandered everything. But that is the great love of the father, which can be misunderstood. It, it, when you look at God, it makes God look like a doormat. 
when he's actually the emperor of the universe. But that's something scandalizing. And I guess as the church, as we identify with our God, we have to be equally prepared to be misunderstood. We have to be equally be prepared that the same way our God shows such benevolent and tremendous mercy, that we must always be able to stand at the side of mercy as well without being overly image conscious. So, what is God saying to us today? What, how, is the, the, how are these stories to live by? I want to return first of all to Luke chapter 15 verse 2 that this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. If this tagline were used of our church, would it stick? Do we understand the joy of calling people back to repentance? Do we feel the sorrow of God when seeing the lost? Secondly, do we understand God as a God of joy? Is celebration and rejoicing part of the Christian life? Or is it a rare part of the Christian life? Do we find more life and more excitement in the things of the world? Um, Euro recently is going on, uh, went on last week, you know, uh, and there's so much life and excitement and joy as people watch the sports. And there's more. Euro is just one example, right? Do we have more excitement in the things of the world compared to the things of God? Uh, I like the way that the father in the story says, we have to celebrate and rejoice. It's not something we do rarely and you know once in a while yeah let's do it no it's like we had to do it we had to do it this guy i thought he was dead i i, I thought i lost that forever i thought i lost his son forever but he's back he's back and he's back for good uh let our christian life be full of, of celebration and rejoicing let's go to a third point how much of our christian life is about restoration maybe we look at the world and we can see many examples of people who need restoration but what about ourselves? How are we being restored to understanding the fullness of our God the way we should? How, how often do we bear with the foolishness of others so that when they turn back, we can welcome them? How often are we actively searching for the lost? How often are we helping to illuminate, to, to, to tell stories like this so that those who are not able to see how far their perspective is from Jesus, they are finally given a chance to do their own ending of the story. Is there any way that we might need a paradigm shift? If you're listening to this for the first time, I want to end this sermon by just um, sharing with you about God's great love for you and that He sent Jesus as the Saviour and Redeemer of the world. Maybe you fit into the sinner category of these stories that Jesus was telling, uh, uh, the people who like Jesus likes to hang out with. Maybe you have become the critic, sullen and angry, not really understanding your identity as a child of God. Maybe you have obeyed all the rules but have always been feeling the short end of the stick. I want you to know, to know that Jesus came for all of us to cleanse us of the obvious and the non-obvious sins, self-righteousness and pride and also of wasteful living. Romans chapter 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And because Jesus died to take away sin and rose from the dead to give eternal life, um, I, I want you to know that even if you are a self-professed sinner or if you're a self-professed moralist, that Jesus is completely comfortable with you and you need a genuine relationship with God uh, wherever you are, that Jesus will be the Lord and Saviour of your life. And so if you're watching this for the first time and you're not sure what to do, uh, I'm just going to uh, ask you to just pray a little prayer with me. And especially if you have religion, but you felt very sullen and simply rule abiding. If you felt that you have just slaved for God all these years, I want to invite you to come back, to know the Father's love for you, to know how to be His Son, to live the life of Jesus now and in the world to come. And if you would, would you just pray together with me? Dear Father, I'm either a self-acclaimed sinner, someone who has lived morally, or someone who has obeyed all the rules joylessly. I, want, and I realize that eternal life is not about me being good enough. It's about you. It's about you wiping all sins away, and me being found in joyous celebration and relationship with you. Help me to know you, the Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help me to follow your ways. I welcome your Holy Spirit living in me. I know that so long any one person is in right relationship with you, all of heaven and the church rejoices. Help me to discover you in your church. In Jesus' name, Amen. If that's been you and you prayed that prayer, 
I'd like to invite you to fill in the Connect card and just let us know how to keep in touch with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we enter prayer now, we pause to be still, to breathe slowly and to gather our scattered senses on the presence of God. We lift our hearts to you, Lord God. You are the one and only God who created heaven and earth, and yet you take the time and care enough to keep track of the hairs on our heads. We are so thankful for what you have done and are continuing to do in our lives and in this world. We rejoice that you have achieved our eternal salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection. And we are thankful for your faithfulness and provision in our temporary seasons here on earth. We are so thankful for the work you are doing in and through Camp Trinity this month. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen and equip all who come to hear your good news. Be with Julie and her leaders and counselors. Keep them encouraged, healthy, and always mindful of the strength that is found in you. We rejoice as we hold up our newly appointed Governor General, Mary Simon. We pray that her work in this role would be empowered and directed by your Holy Spirit. We bring to you now all the muck in our hearts from this past week. We acknowledge the many times we have responded out of fear, out of self-protection, out of judgment of others. We repent of the times when we think that our plan is best and we can do life without you. And we also repent of the times when we are self-righteous and believe ourselves to be more obedient to you than perhaps we are. Lord Jesus, through the power of your cross, we are confident that you will forgive us and that you will continue the work of cleaning the muck out of our hearts as you change us to be more like you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our midst. We ask that you would breathe into us a revived passion for God's kingdom work. Help us to eagerly and energetically strive for restoration where there is deep damage and division, for peace where there is anguish, pain, and conflict. Fill us up with your unending joy and love as we do this work with you. We pray all of these things in your holy and life-giving name. Amen. And once again, thank you everyone for joining us at Online Church at Trinity Streetsville. Uh, the service isn't quite over, do stick around as Libby and the band have one more song uh, for us. Uh, we'd like you to uh, come for coffee hour as well. Coffee hour is right after the service. You can register, the link is in the service description. And for today, we have uh, Stephen interviewing Amanda Templeton. Uh, Amanda will share her personal experience of being lost and found, so don't miss it. Uh, join us next week as we continue our sermon series, Stories to Live By. We have a guest preacher, Darcy Lazert, so uh, we can all be looking forward to that. And so uh, as we go, let me just uh, say a word of blessing. May God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the source of all goodness and growth, pour His blessing upon all things created and upon you, His children, that you may use His gifts to His glory and the welfare of all peoples. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Here's Libby and the worship team.